let's start. Uh, how many of you are here for the very first time? Wonderful. That's because that's good. Because I'm going to do some of the uh, housekeeping things, uh, things like um, fire exits and that kind of thing. So we have. You can exit where you came out, and then if there's a fire over there, that's a bad idea, so then you can exit this way. <laughs> uh, and there are two toilets, uh, if you need them. One is right behind that curtain there, and then into the kitchen and around there's another one. Uh, turn off your phones. Uh, also, vibrate isn't, isn't good. Um, I'm sure you can even hear that. So that, I think, were the practical things. Um, yeah, so my name is uh, Martin Stern, and uh, I'm the founder of, of this place, which is called the Eshe Norgen Mind Training Center. And um, um, it's part of uh, an organization that's called the FPMT Foundation of the Preservation of the Mahayana Tradition, which um, was founded by uh, two Tibetan teachers, Lama Yeshin and Lama Sopa. So there's actually centers in this tradition uh, all around the world. I don't know, maybe, what is it, guys have 40 centers or 40 countries, I mean? Do you have any? I think, uh, yeah, it is centers and study groups. They are like 160 countries, in fact. 160 countries? Yeah. Centers. Centers. Yeah. centers. Centers, yes, in 40 countries, something like that, yeah. <laughs> 3,000 countries all over the world. <laughs> um, no, but, and I guess the, the idea is that we have all these uh, places to go and keep in shape physically. Why not a place to go to tend to our mind and our hearts and our brains? So that's why it's a mind training center. And we are fortunate enough to have uh, the opportunity to be able to invite. Uh, we have a lot of traveling teachers. Last weekend, um, there was a, a wonderful teacher, her name is Venerable Yenten, and this week we have had the pleasure of inviting Glenn Svensson back. He, he's been here before, but the first time to the center. And Glenn is uh, a very, very experienced meditation teacher. He did uh, six years of, of uh, full-time study of Buddhist psychology and philosophy. He's now traveling all the time, I think, teaching meditation. So right. that's, that's what you do. <laughs> Mainly. Yeah. Um, so you're really in for a treat. Today is, uh, is more of an introductory talk. And then if you find any of this interested and feel a bit hooked, then we have a four-day meditation retreat coming up this weekend. And you can do, if you're not able to do uh, four full days, it's Friday and Monday as well, then uh, you're also welcome to come uh, for one day and, and participate. And then we have lots of other things on our program, uh, both weekly schedule and um, <coughs> when we invite teachers. So please have a look at the website, sign up maybe to our mailing list. Um, Glenn will also introduce mind and its potential tomorrow. Yes, thank you. So we have, we're have we starting this study program for people who are interested more in Buddhist psychology and, and philosophy. There's a program called Discovering Buddhism that will be running on Wednesday evenings. And the first session, uh, or the first module of that is called Mind and Its Potential. And tomorrow, Glenn will be teaching on that subject. So if you're interested in learning about what the mind is, at least from from the Buddhist uh, philosophical perspective. Tomorrow is the night uh, to do that. And I promise to be short. Uh, I've been long, so I'm going to shut up now and hand over to Glenn. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Martin. Um, so good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome here to Yeshi Nobu, and welcome to this evening's talk titled um, Cultivating Mental Balance and Well-Being. Um, and this talk is about how to cultivate a state of inner well-being uh, through focusing on four types of mental balance, uh, motivational, attentional, cognitive, and emotional. And this talk is 
based on an article written um, by Alan Wallace, a long-term Buddhist, and Shauna Shapiro, a psychologist, and it's titled Mental Balance and Wellbeing, Building Bridges Between Buddhism and Western Psychology. Um, and anyone who's interested, I think there's some spare copies of that available at the end of the talk you can take with you and have a read of that. So my talk is based on this article. Um, and what we're going to be doing this evening in these two hours that we have is first I'm going to define what do we mean by well-being. Um, then we're going to look at what, what are these four types of mental balance? What, what do they mean? And then the most of the talk is about how to cultivate them, how we can cultivate those four types of mental balance to help us to find that state of, of inner well-being. Um, then we're going to have a little break. Um, and then after the break, we're going to do a little meditation re uh, regarding these four types of mental balance. And then at the end of the talk, I want to look at how, why it's important to have an integrated approach incorporating each one of those four types of mental balance if we really want to <coughs> find this state of well-being, inner well-being. And then there'll be time for some question and answer at the end of the session. So what I'd like to do to begin is just do a very short sort of meditation just to relax the body and relax the mind uh, so that we can uh, get in a good state for this evening. So if you just like to sit nice and comfortable, we'll begin with that. Allowing your awareness to descend into the body and simply become aware of sensations throughout the body. And if you notice any areas of tightness or tension in any part of the body, then use the out breath to relax and release that tightness or tension as best you can. And bringing your awareness to the area of your face and soften and relax all the muscles in the face. The mouth and jaw soft and relaxed. And all the muscles around the eyes soft and relaxed. In this way, allowing the entire body to become completely relaxed, completely at ease. and relaxing more deeply with each out-breath. <coughs> 
and with each out breath, letting go of any thoughts that may have arisen, happily releasing them. And allowing the mind to come to rest in the present moment. And simply become aware of the rhythm of your breath. Noticing if it's long or short, deep or shallow, regular or irregular. without trying to modify the breath in any way. Simply noticing the rhythm of the breath. And now with that more relaxed body and mind, we can begin our talk here this evening together. So first, what do we mean by well-being? And I'd like to start with a, a quote from His Holiness Dalai Lama, who says, I believe that the very purpose of life is to seek happiness. Whether one believes in religion or not, whether one believes in this religion or that religion, we are all seeking something better in life. So I think the very motion of our life is towards happiness. And then a quote from the, the article here says, um, the goal of Buddhist practice is the realization of a state of well-being that is not contingent on the presence of pleasurable stimuli, either external or internal. According to Buddhism, this movement toward well-being is a fundamental part of being human. So then when we talk about well-being or happiness, we can talk about two types of happiness. Temporal happiness and genuine happiness. Temporal happiness is another name for our pleasurable experiences. So this is what's called stimulus-based happiness, that we receive some stimulus, we have a pleasant experience. And therefore, it's often called what's called conditioned happiness. We need certain conditions to come together to have those pleasurable experiences. And what we can understand from these pleasurable experiences is they're temporary or transient, meaning when the stimulus finishes, the pleasant experience finishes. And therefore, they're unreliable because we can't just click our fingers and have a pleasant experience whenever we want one. We need a stimulus. No stimulus, no pleasant experience. And if we look at our pleasurable experiences very closely, we'll actually come to see they're not really even in the nature of happiness. Because if our pleasurable experiences were in the nature of happiness, it would mean the more we indulged in our pleasurable experiences, the more happy we should become. But we know from our own experiences that often when we overindulge in our pleasurable experiences, 
Not only don't we become more happy, we often induce a lot of unnecessary suffering. For example, eating too much of our favourite dessert, spending too long out in nice warm sunshine. Um, so what we can understand is these pleasurable experiences are relative experiences. Relative to a previous state, they're an improvement, but if we overindulge, they often turn into suffering themselves. Whereas genuine happiness is another name for this inner, this state of inner well-being, this is not stimulus-based happiness, meaning we don't need any particular stimulus to have this genuine happiness. So therefore, it's called unconditioned happiness. It doesn't require certain conditions to come together. Therefore, it's stable, it's reliable, and it is in the nature of happiness. And this is really all about being in harmony with the interdependent nature of reality. So when we're talking about um, striving for a state of well-being, we're talking about this genuine happiness in a well-being. And in the article here, it says, what is important is not to conflate the two and mistakenly believe that external pleasures will bring lasting happiness. And that's unfortunately what we often do. We often hope that the first one is going to give us the second one. We're often wanting or hoping our pleasurable experiences to be fulfilling and satisfying and lasting. And so therefore what happens, of course, is we end up with craving and attachment for them, holding on to them, trying to make them last. But of course, when we do that, then with that craving and attachment often comes a lot of worry and anxiety about not getting them, not getting enough of them or losing them. And then, of course, frustration when we don't get them, overindulging when we do get them, and then often dissatisfaction when they don't live up to our expectations. And then we feel the reason we're not fulfilled is we just didn't get enough of that. So it's a vicious cycle. So we end up with more craving, more attachment, which creates even more suffering. But here, of course, we're not saying it's a choice. And that's often what people mistakenly think, that they think, oh, either I have to choose pleasure or I have to choose genuine happiness. And then if I go for genuine happiness, somehow I'm going to miss out on my pleasure. Actually, it's exact opposite. In fact, the, there's a quote from the article which says, the enjoyment of such transient pleasures is not in opposition to the cultivation of positive attitudes and commitments or the cultivation of the types of mental balance that yield inner well-being. In fact, one may derive greater enjoyment from pleasures as a result of cultivating well-being. Because if we are striving for the second one, it means that we are letting go of craving and attachment for the first one because we know the first one is never going to give us the second one. And when we get live, let go of craving and attachment for our pleasurable experiences, actually we enjoy them much more than we would now when we do now when we have craving and attachment. So actually you'll enjoy simple pleasures in life much more. So it's not a choice. Um, and the article here says then, the true causes of such well-being are rooted in a wholesome way of life, are nurtured through the cultivation of mental balance and come to fruition in the experience of wisdom and compassion. So normally in Buddhism, we, the standard model we see for striving for genuine happiness, well-being is these what's called three higher trainings, three, three areas of practice if we want to find that state of genuine happiness in a well-being that the basis is ethics, foundation of ethics, avoiding harmful behavior. On that basis, we engage in the concentration practice, develop single pointed concentration. And on that basis, we enter into what's called the wisdom practice, or sometimes it's called Vipassana practice to gain an insight into nature of reality. So this is the standard model that you see in pretty well all Buddhist traditions. But here, in this article, they're trying to build the bridge between Buddhism and Western psychology. So instead of the standard uh, three practice model, we have this four state, this four model, the four the model of the four types of 
mental balance. So the article says to help open up collaborative dialogue between Buddhism and Western psychology, this article introduces a fourfold model of well-being, drawing from Buddhist teachings as well as Western psychology and research. So let's have a look at these four types of mental balance, what they are, and how do we go about cultivating them so we can strive for this genuine happiness and inner well-being. So the first one is called motivational balance. Actually, in the article, they call it cognitive ba uh, balance. It's just a sort of technical word, but we're talking here about motivation. So this is defined, it says motivational balance results from reality-based desires and intentions that are oriented towards one's own and others' happiness. So motivational balance is about having healthy, reality-based desires and aspirations for happiness. Attentional balance is the ability to sustain a voluntary flow of attention with a quality of awareness that is suffused by ease, focus and clarity. So attentional balance is simply to cultivate a calm, clear and focused mind, to simply develop our attention skills. Cognitive balance involves engaging with the world of experience without projecting assumptions or ideas which cause us to misapprehend reality. So very simply, cognitive balance is seeing reality as it is, without distorting reality. And emotional balance, which in the article is actually called affective balance, it says here, emotional balance entails a freedom from excessive emotional vacillation, emotional apathy, and inappropriate emotions. So emotional balance is about responding to situations in a healthy way rather than reacting to situations in a very unhealthy way. So that's emotional balance. So that's very briefly what the four types are. So let's now have a look at each one and how do we go about cultivating that balance? Because we, in all of these four areas, I think we all have imbalances now. How do we correct those imbalances? How do we achieve balance in each one of those four areas? Because if we can achieve balance in each one of those four areas, then that's really going to go a long way towards us to cultivate this state of genuine happiness and inner well-being. And in the article, it talks about three ways in which we're imbalanced, three types of imbalance. Deficit, hyperactivity, dysfunctional. So deficit means simply not enough of that. Hyperactivity, too much. Dysfunctional, wrong type. So in each one of these areas, we have these three types of imbalance, either not enough of it, too much of it, or the wrong type, dysfunctional. So let's have a look at first motivational balance. So remember, motivational balance was defined as, it says, motivational balance results from reality-based desires and intentions that are oriented towards one's own and others' happiness. So in terms of imbalance, deficit, meaning not enough, is we just have no desire for happiness. We just loss of desire for happiness. We're just apathetic towards happiness. And of course, that often comes in our modern society because we feel like it's impossible to find happiness. So we just sort of give up. We have no desire. We've lost desire for happiness. Another one is the second the hyperactivity is obsessive desires. And uh, I think in our modern society, we have very much of this, too much of this. In fact, we not only have obsessive of desires, but we have, we're even to the point of addiction, you know, that we're often addicted to sensory stimulation, we're addicted to intellectual stimulation, we're addicted to our thinking, obsessive compulsive thinking, and then we're even addicted to just doing things in general, activity in general. Um, in fact, there was um, recently a study done, you may have heard about it, I think it was Time Magazine did it. Um, and what they did was they put people in a room. It was just a white room, nothing to see. They put a chair in the middle of the room 
and they asked people to sit there quietly for 15 minutes and do nothing. The only option they had was they gave each person a little device that could give themselves a painful electrical shock. 65% <laughs> of men preferred to shock themselves painfully than sit quietly and do nothing. Women were a little bit better. Only 25% of women preferred to shock themselves than sit quietly and do nothing. So we had this obsession with doing. We had this obsession, these obsessivenesses. And then, of course, dysfunctional is simply desiring the wrong things, desiring things which are not really conducive to our own and others' happiness. And I think we also know this quite well. So these are the imbalances. So how can we overcome these imbalances? Because I think uh, probably all of us have somewhat each one of those from time to time. So in terms of deficit, um, a loss of desire for happiness, what's helpful is to reflect on the possibility for change. This idea of what's in called impermanence, that things are changing. Because often we feel like we're stuck there's no hope for a change. So if we really reflect on the possibility of change, then we can think, okay, maybe not so well today, but things change over time. That will help. In terms of hyperactivity, obsessive desires is to really develop a sense of contentment, particularly understanding that, you know, chasing after more stuff out there is not going to really make us more happy. It's just going to give more stress and a lot of problems. So to develop a sense of contentment. But I really think for both of those and for dysfunctional is we really need to go back and identify what is really the underlying <coughs> source of our happiness and our suffering. Because now we tend to feel like it's out there, that the source of my happiness and suffering is out there. But if we really reflect on this, we can really become to appreciate that really the underlying source of our happiness and suffering lies within our own mind. Because it's not really what happens to us is the main thing. It's really what, how we respond to what happens to us is really going to determine our experiences. And this was also highlighted recently in another study I saw, a study on pain. And so they had participants in the group and they had uh, applied, I think, to their legs some sort of heat pad that was quite painful. And they asked the participants to measure their level of pain from zero up to 100. And they kept asking them to keep reporting level of pain. And initially, the average was 66. And at the same time as that, they had an intravenous drip in their arm. And initially, they were just putting saline solution in, so nothing. But they kept asking them the level of pain. 66 was the average originally. Then what they did was they started putting painkiller in without telling them, but they just kept telling them, keep telling us pain level. So you would expect the number should decrease. No, they're getting painkiller, and it did. It went from 66 to 55. Then they didn't change anything. They kept giving them painkiller, but now they told them they were getting painkiller. So nothing changed, but magically it went from 55 to 39. But now here's the really interesting part. They kept giving them painkiller, but now they told them they're stopping the painkilling, expect pain. So nothing changed, but 39 went to 64. So it was just their aversion, their fear of pain that created a lot of suffering, self-induced. And I think if we really reflect on this, we can really appreciate that it's how we react to things that really determines our experience. There's really our reactions to pleasant and unpleasant things that's going to determine our level of happiness and suffering. So this is how we can really cultivate this motivational balance is really, I think the important thing here is to really make that shift from source of my happiness and suffering is out there to being in here. And if we make that shift, I think already uh, we're setting up a very good basis for moving towards a state of genuine happiness and well-being. But of course, just that is not enough. We need to look at the other three types of balance as well to have a uh, integrated approach. So that's the first one. That's motivational balance. So let's now look at attentional balance. So 
So attentional balance, again, in the article is defined as the ability to sustain a voluntary flow of attention with a quality of awareness that is suffused by ease, focus and clarity. So again, it's simply to cultivate a calm, clear and focused mind. So again, same three types of imbalances, deficit, hyperactivity, dysfunctional. So deficit, meaning not enough attention, is what we, in the technical word is laxity, is simply dull, dullness. Our mind is dull. We're not seeing clearly what's in front of us. Hyperactivity, too much, is our mind gets agitated and distracted or often called excitation or distraction. And then dysfunctional is simply attending to things in afflictive ways, in wrong ways. And this often comes from the other three types of imbalances of motivational, cognitive and emotional. So this is very much corrected through the other three areas. So I want to focus just on these two imbalances of either dullness or agitation and distraction. The two main sort of imbalances in developing attention skills, developing attentional balance. So let's have a look at how we can overcome those imbalances and cultivate attentional balance, improve our attention skills. Uh, firstly, there are two tools we need to do this, and they are mindfulness and introspection. Mindfulness here, of course, is very popular now in the, the modern world. In fact, it's become a little bit trendy now, mindfulness. Um, but what we need to realize is that how the word mindfulness was used in Buddhism originally and how it's now used in a lot of modern mindfulness movements is not the same. It's been redefined. The, the word mindfulness originally comes from the Sanskrit word smirti or the Pali word sati. And both of these words here literally mean memory, to remember. So mindfulness is simply our ability to remember the object, to be able to focus on the object without forgetting it, without becoming distracted. Whereas in a lot of modern traditions, it's been redefined to something like a non-judgmental awareness of whatever is arising in the present moment. Very good thing. But this is not really how mindfulness is originally defined. So we just need to be aware of that difference. Otherwise, there can be a lot of confusion. So this is the main tool we use in cultivating attentional balance. But we need a second tool, and that's introspection. Introspection is quality control. So mindfulness is simply remembering the object, holding the object. And introspection is monitoring the mindfulness noticing if we're becoming dull or distracted and then reapplying mindfulness if we notice we've become dull or distracted. And so we do that, we develop this by focusing on a particular object. But what object should we focus on? The general recommendation is use the one that works best for you. And so what we find in most Buddhist traditions the one that's most emphasized is the breath, so focusing on the breath, usually either focusing in the area of the abdomen, rising lower abdomen, or at the entrance of the nostrils. That's the, probably the two most common objects of focus within Buddhist traditions. And I think a lot of the modern day mindfulness traditions also often emphasize the breath. But there are two other objects that I think, particularly in our modern society, are extremely beneficial for this practice. And that is to focus on our own mind or simply rest in what's called awareness, resting in awareness. And these are actually the two topics that um, I'm going to be talking about tomorrow, what is the mind in the talk tomorrow evening session, but also the four day retreat over this weekend is really primarily about developing attentional balance using mind and awareness mainly. It's called stillness in motion. It's like a combination of those two. And many people find that challenging to look at their mind or rest in awareness, but there are 
huge benefits in our modern world because many of us in the modern world are often tormented by our own minds. We're often overwhelmed by our thoughts, emotions, and memories. And we've really made our own mind our, often our worst enemy. This practice, developing attentional balance using the mind or awareness, can really help us to become the masters of our mind instead of being the slaves of our mind, to make our mind our best friend. So it really has enormous benefits. And again, I mentioned many of us in the modern world, we have this obsessive compulsive thinking. Our mind is just constantly going over, round and round all day long. And we really get tired from it. And of course, we don't know how to deal with that. And so either we let it keep going, which overwhelms us and, and makes us exhausted, or the other thing we often do is we just try and stuff, we try and stop it. But trying to suppress thoughts is like throwing petrol on the fire, it just makes it worse. So this practice here can help us to overcome that, to really make our mind our best friend. And whether we're using the breath, mind, awareness, or some other object of focus, we're really cultivating three qualities. Um, and usually the first one is not talked about much in Buddhism, in fact. But I think, again, in our modern society, it's very important. Because many people in the modern world come into meditation with very busy, hectic lives, a lot of agitation, a lot of stress, our minds are chaotic, and then you hear, focus on your breath or focus on something. And, and then we go, okay, I can do that. And what we do is we use our normal approach of focus that we do in daily life. What do we do whenever we focus on anything in our life, an object or task? We tense. We tense. Because we feel if we don't tense, we're just going to get distracted. So we tense when we focus at work, at home, wherever. And unfortunately, that works a little bit. But we know from our own experience, if we focus on anything with a lot of tension, longer, we could become completely exhausted and often become very agitated. But that's our way of focus. And so when we come to meditation and someone says, focus on your breath, what do we do? We tense. And we can focus a little bit. We go, oh, yeah, I can do this. It's not too hard. But then we start getting problems in meditation even to the point where people sometimes say that they get headaches from meditating. And we just wound up, we're just too tight, we're too tense. So I think for many beginners in meditation, the main problem is we're simply too tight, we're too tense, we're simply trying too hard. It's not going to work. So here, with attentional balance, in the modern world, the very first thing we need to do is learn how to do this, relax. Relax the body, relax the mind. I think it's something many of us have forgotten how to do. We're completely wound up from the time we wake up until we collapse in our bed exhausted at the end of the day. That's not sustainable. So in attentional balance, the first thing we need to do is just relax the body, relax the mind, overcome the tension. Then we can work on improving stability of our attention to overcome the distraction and then improve the clarity of our attention to overcome dullness. So this uh, is how we then cultivate this attentional balance, using mindfulness with a relaxed body and mind, focus, introspection, monitoring that. If we start to become a bit dull, sharpen the focus. If we begin to get agitated and distracted, come back, relax. So this is how we balance and we've achieved attentional balance, but it can only work on the basis of relaxation. Otherwise, we're just gonna get ourselves wound up more and more and more and spin out as we usually do. We'll get completely exhausted as we often do. So this is how to cultivate attentional balance. So let's now look at cognitive balance. So again, cognitive balance, in the article it says, Cognitive balance involves engaging with the world of experience without projecting assumptions or ideas which cause us to misapprehend reality. So again, same three same type, three types of imbalance. Deficit, not enough. Hyperactivity, too much. Dysfunctional, wrong type. So deficit 
in terms of cognitive balance is just simply failing to perceive what's actually in front of us. Hyperactivity is projection, meaning we are projecting, we are superimposing our own ideas and assumptions on top of reality. And then dysfunctional is, um, is having a distorted view of reality through a, uh, usually a combination of the first two. I want to just briefly mention four common distortions we have of reality. And I think we all have these distortions. The first is we tend to see things which are changing as unchanging. You know, this is this idea of impermanence. Intellectually, I think we all accept impermanence. You know, the, thing that, the fact that things are changing moment by moment. Science has proven it. We learned it at school. I think we all accept that, don't we, intellectually? Uh, do we interact with things as if they're changing moment by moment? No. <laughs> when we look at a cup and we interact with a cup or anything, it seems instinctively that it's quite unchanging. You know, this is the same cup that was here yesterday. It'll be the same cup here tomorrow. That's how we interact with things. We don't interact with things based on intellectual understanding. Our instinctive habits are telling us that's not really changing. That's our view of reality. So that's one distortion. So what we really need to do in terms of cognitive balance here is bring that intellectual understanding of impermanence into experience. We can only do that through meditation to experientially see, in fact, things are changing moment by moment. Then our life will change dramatically. Pleasure as happiness. Happiness is coming from out there. I just need to get more pleasure, more stuff, more enjoyment, and I'll be more happy. No self as self. There seems to be here a me that seems to be something more than just the body and the mind, something extra. There's a third thing, a me, a me that has a body and has a mind. That's how we see ourselves as a person. That is this idea of self. So self is a, a false, overinflated sense of me. The, the idea that there's a me here that is something more than the body and the mind, in addition to the body and the mind. And then lastly, to see things which are dependent as independent. So again, I think most of us intellectually at some level Except we live in a world of interdependency. You know, we see that climate change, all sorts of things. Everything's interdependent. So I think all of us intellectually at some level accept that. But again, instinctively, is that how we see ourselves in the world? Or do we instinctively feel there's a me here and there's an objective world there? Is that how we relate to the world and ourselves? I think so, instinctively. But is there an independent me here and an independent world there? If we investigate, maybe not. But again, it has to be more than just intellectual knowledge. So cognitive balance is not simply correct intellectual understanding. Cognitive balance is experiential understanding, experientially seeing reality as it is, not just intellectually knowing. Because intellectually knowing these things, not that difficult, really. I think most of us probably accept most of those at some level now intellectually. But that's not enough because how we're experientially seeing the world is these four distorted ways, I think. And that's why we have a lot of problems in our life. So how do we overcome this cognitive imbalance? Through what's called the four applications of mindfulness is that we now need to investigate with our mindfulness the world, ourselves and the world. We can investigate our own body, our feelings, our mind, and then just phenomena in general. How do these things exist? And if we look closely at all of these things, we'll come to four insights. We'll come to see experientially that actually everything is changing moment by moment. That there is no happy, genuine happiness to be found out there. That's what they mean by suffering here. 
that if we look, there is no me here that is something more than the body and the mind, something extra. And if we look very closely, we'll come to see that everything is interdependent, that nothing exists independently. And that's this idea of emptiness in Buddhism. So emptiness is just the sort of the flip side of the fact that everything is interdependent. So emptiness just means nothing is independent. So these are the four insights that we will come to if we do this investigation. But if we don't investigate, then at best we'll have some intellectual understanding, which is not really going to change anything. So cognitive balance is experientially seeing reality as it is. So that's cognitive balance. Let's now look at emotional balance. So again, emotional balance entails a freedom from excessive emo emotional vacillation, emotional apathy and inappropriate emotions. So again, in terms of the three types of imbalance, deficit, hyperactivity, dysfunctional. So deficit, here in terms of emotional balance is simply being apathetic and indifferent to other people and things around us. Hyperactivity is this sort of vacillation, this oscillation between elation, depression, excitement or fear, um, um, attachment, aversion, hope and fear. We're just completely oscillating between extremes all the time in our reactions. And dysfunctional here is simply inappropriate reactions, uh, responding in inappropriate ways with anger, jealousy, grasping, craving, and so forth. So how can we overcome these imbalances here? Is through cultivating emotional balance is we can do it through cultivating particularly four qualities. Um, the first of those is loving kindness. And loving kindness is simply the wish for ourselves and others to be happy or to have happiness in its causes. Here we need to distinguish between loving kindness and sometimes the, the original word in um, Pali in, in is metta in Sanskrit Maitri. Sometimes that's translated as love, but I think here that can be a bit confusing because when we use the word love in the English language, it's an emotion and often it implies some sort of intimate behavior. Whereas here, loving kindness is not an emotion. It's an aspiration. It's a wish. It's an aspirational wish for ourselves and others to be happy. So better to translate as loving kindness rather than as love. But here, I think it's important to distinguish between love and loving kindness and attachment. Because often we're, we're confused about that. And it often seems like they're sort of the same thing. Um, but actually they're, they're completely opposite. In a relationship, when we're talking about love or loving kindness, it's simply the wish for that person to be happy. The fine print, of course, is without expecting anything in return. What we would call unconditional love, no strings attached love. Conditional love is love polluted by attachment. Because actually attachment is all about me. Attachment is only interested in my happiness. And in fact, attachment sees the other person as a thing, an object to satisfy me. So not very nice. But conditional love, love polluted by attachment, sounds like this. I will love you as long as, and here comes the condition, as long as you keep saying and doing things that make me happy. Otherwise, no. So that's all attachment speaking. So very simply, the difference between love and attachment is love is saying, I want you to be happy. Attachment is saying, I want you to make me happy. So attachment <coughs> is not even seeing the other person as a person. Really, attachment sees the other person as a thing, an object to satisfy me. So not very nice. 
What we need to realize, of course, is in all our relationships, there's a mixture. And what we need to do is we need to distinguish these two aspects because usually they're mixed together. We need to distinguish them and increase the healthy one, the loving kindness, and decrease the unhealthy one, attachment, as much as possible. The more we can do that, the better our relationships will be. And what we need to realize is that our life is pervaded by attachment and not think, oh, by next week, I'll get rid of my attachment. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. It'll be a lifelong thing. But the more we can work on reducing attachment to in our relationships, to things in general, the more we can reduce that, the better our life's going to be. So that's loving kindness or love. Compassion is the wish for ourselves and others to be free of suffering and its causes. And both these loving kindness and compassion, when we're cultivating these, we're, we're cultivating this emotional balance, it's recommended that we cultivate, we practice these in stages. That in the traditional text, it, it says, first, cultivate loving kindness and compassion to your friends, because it's most easy. Once you're comfortable with that, expand out to people you don't know very well. Once you're comfortable there, start to expand it out to people who you find difficult, the so-called enemy, and then you can expand it out to everyone. That's the traditional four-step approach that's mentioned. But I think in our modern world, we need to add one more step that normally you won't see, and we need to add it right at the beginning, and that is to cultivate loving kindness and compassion to ourselves first. Because I think generally, or very often in our modern world, we're not very kind and compassionate to ourselves. In fact, we often suffer from a lot of guilt, low self-esteem, and even self-hatred. So if we're not kind and compassionate to ourselves, we're not going to be able to extend that out to others. So that's where we need to begin. Why, why, is, there, why is there such an epidemic of low self-esteem in, in our modern society? Because in fact, I think these sorts of things in a lot of the older societies didn't really exist or not to this extent that we do today. And I think there's really two things that contribute why we have such an epidemic of guilt, low self-esteem and self-hatred in our modern society. One is we have an obsessive focus on the negative in our modern world. Look in the media. What percentage of news is about bad things? I'd say more than 95%. Does that mean 95% of things that are happening in the world are bad? I don't think so. In fact, I saw a study recently they did where um, it was over the last, say, five, I think it was five years, and it was, it was in a particular area, I think in the US or something, and they asked people's perceptions about crime and, and all of these things. Is it, is it getting better or worse? And they all say, no, no, it's getting much worse. When in fact, statistically, it was crime was decreasing, all of these things were decreasing, but people's perception was it was getting much worse because that's what's being pumped out in the world, in the news. So we had this obsessive focus on the negative to start with. And then the other thing that contributes to low self-esteem, guilt and self-hatred is we do what's called cognitive fusion, is we identify ourselves with our thoughts, emotions and so forth. You know, how often do we hear people say, I'm an angry person, that's me, you better accept that. Or I'm hopeless, I'm weak, I'm this, I'm that. We are none of those things. We are not our thoughts, we are not our emotions, we are not our behavior. We have thoughts, we have emotions, we have habits, we have certain behaviors, we have a personality. Therefore, we are none of those things. You can't have something and be it. But the way which we think and speak is that. I'm an angry person. I'm this. I'm hopeless. We're not. What we need to say is not I'm an angry person. I have a habit of being angry or getting angry. It's not me. And if we don't 
wrongly identify ourselves with our thoughts, emotions, and habits, and personality, then we can still feel good about ourselves. We can have good self-esteem and at the same time address those bad habits and work with them. But if we identify with those bad habits, we end up with a fixed biased view of ourselves. And then, of course, naturally, low self-esteem and self-hatred and guilt will follow. So we need to avoid wrongly identifying ourselves with our thoughts, emotions and behaviours and personalities first. Secondly, have a balanced view of ourselves and the world. And to help that, the third one is necessary. Empathetic joy. Empathetic joy is a rejoicing in our own and others' virtues and good fortune. So it's a focusing on the positive things in ourselves and others. We need to balance. <laughs> Actually, there was another study that I saw they did was um, they had partners, couples, and, you know, it seemed, would seem logical that if one of the partners did a certain level of negative behaviour, to neutralise that, they should do maybe the equivalent level positive behaviour to neutralise. Seems reasonable, doesn't it? Is that what the study showed? <laughs> no way. In fact, if a partner did a certain level of negative behaviour, to neutralise that, the partner had to do four or five equivalent positive opposite actions to neutralise that. That's how much we're focused on the negative, obsessive. So empathetic joy, again, I think in our modern world is so, so important, is to to rejoice in the good things. And together with that, the idea of gratitude, you know, to be grateful for things and really focus on the positives. Otherwise, we end up with this distorted, fixed, biased view of ourselves and the world. And then lastly, um, equanimity here is about having an impartial, unbiased attitude towards everyone. Now we tend to be very biased and impartial. And again, it's because we tend to have this very narrow focus of me, 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 me. How is this situation affecting me? And then what we tend to do is, based on that perspective, we categorise people into three groups, simply from the perspective, how are they affecting me? So the people around us who seem to be supporting me in my happiness, friend. People around us who don't seem to be affecting us anyway, stranger. Those people who seem to be interfering with me and my happiness and maybe seem to be causing me suffering, enemy. And then, of course, we end up with attachment to friends because they seem to be the, the source of our happiness. Apathy to strangers because couldn't care less what happens to them. They're not affecting me. And then to the people who seem to be interfering with my happiness, hostility, anger, hatred. So equanimity is about overcoming that by understanding we're all in the same situation. We all want to be happy. We all want to be free of suffering. We're all equal in that regard and develop a sense of closeness to everyone, that we're all stuck in the same situation. Because it's equanimity that allows us to really cultivate the other three qualities effectively. Because without equanimity, loving kindness and compassion, very difficult. Loving kindness and compassion to strangers, not really, couldn't care less what happens to them. Loving kindness and compassion to difficult people, no way. In fact, I hope they suffer. They deserve to suffer because they're trying to harm me. And loving kindness and compassion to friends, okay, but only as long as they keep saying and doing things that make me happy. Otherwise, no way. So we can't develop loving kindness and compassion authentically to anyone without this equanimity. So this is how to cultivate emotional balance, that if we can really cultivate these qualities toward ourselves and others, then we'll have much better emotional balance. We won't be reacting. Instead of reacting with attachment and aversion, we'll be responding with loving kindness and compassion. So that's emotional balance. So these are very briefly the four types of balance, mental balance. What are the imbalances and how we overcome those? So it's time now for a 10 minute break. After the break, I'd like to do a meditation where we really try to internalize some of these ideas we've been talking about to really start to reflect on them internally. And then after that meditation, I'd like to talk a bit more about why an integrated model is important. Why, if we leave out any one of those four areas, 
we're really leaving ourselves very short in terms of trying to find this inner well-being, this genuine happiness, and the importance of an integrated model, and then there'll be some time for some question and answer. What I'd like to do now to continue is first start with a, a little meditation where we really internalize some of the points that we've covered just to sort of reflect on and try and internalize some of these ideas. So we'll start with that and then we'll look at the importance of an integrated model. We can begin by preparing the body. So just keeping the back nice and straight. And at the same time, allow the entire body to become completely relaxed. using the out-breath to relax and release any tightness or tension in any part of the body. allowing the breathing to flow naturally and effortlessly. Not trying to control the breath in any way. And then preparing the mind, setting it into a state of ease and relaxation. Simply allowing it to come to rest in the present moment. And simply become aware of the rhythm of the breath. We all want to be happy and we all want to be free of suffering.
And it often seems to us as if the source of our happiness and the source of our suffering is out there in the world. And as a result, one of the main methods we use to try to find happiness and overcome suffering is that we try to manipulate the things around us. We try to attract people places and things that seem to be the source of our happiness. And we try to push away or avoid people, places and things that seem to be the source of our suffering. However, is this an effective strategy? With this strategy, are we getting any closer to overcoming suffering and finding genuine happiness? No matter how hard we try to control and manipulate the things around us, we still seem to encounter suffering and we're still chasing after that elusive happiness. All that we're really achieving with this method is that we are trapping ourselves in the hope-fear cycle. Hoping for pleasant things and fearing or worrying about unpleasant things. And if we don't get the things we want, we often become frustrated. And even if we do get the things we want, they never really fully satisfy us and we simply end up craving for more. So what's the solution?
according to Buddhism, we're simply looking in the wrong place. What would happen if we instead turned our attention to our own mind? What would happen if we began to cultivate more mindfulness, to cultivate a more calm, clear and focused mind? And what would happen if we could begin to see things more clearly and accurately without projecting or distorting what we apprehend? And what would happen if we began to reduce our mental afflictions, such as anger and attachment, craving, jealousy and anxiety? And instead of reacting to things out of old habits, we could begin to respond in ways more conducive to our own and others' happiness. And what would happen if we began to cultivate loving kindness and compassion towards ourselves and others? And what would happen if we could begin to see difficult situations in our life, not as problems or obstacles, but rather see them as opportunities for personal growth and development. So let's set a positive motivation, a motivation wishing to discover practical methods to overcome our mental afflictions and suffering and to find that genuine happiness and inner well-being. And we can expand that motivation out to include others. Also wishing to help those around us to do likewise.
so we can bring the meditation to a close. So let's now see why it's important to have an integrated approach to really pay attention to each one of these four areas of mental balance. And I've put these four areas of mental balance in this sort of flow chart in this way for a particular reason. And that is that I think the starting point is motivational balance. That if we don't first cultivate the sort of healthy reality-based desires and aspirations for happiness, I think the other three don't really make any sense at all. And unfortunately, we see this a little bit in some of the modern mindfulness traditions. Because often they've taken mindfulness from Buddhism, and mindfulness, of course, is the key element in attentional balance. And so what a lot of these modern traditions are doing uh, is they look at mindfulness, they go, yep, that's useful, we'll take that. Well, I'm not so sure about all that other stuff, though. You know, that's that sort of religious stuff, you know, that ethics and compassion and... No, no, I think we can get rid of that. We don't want that. But this mindfulness is good. So they sort of often take it out and then they present it as like this sort of magic pill of mindfulness. You just take the magic pill of mindfulness and all your problems will go away. And they won't. In fact, your problems may get worse. And now, because of that, we're actually starting to see some articles being written. One I read recently that said the dark side of mindfulness or is something like is mindfulness really good for you what the article should have really said is the dangers of mindfulness without a framework because particularly if this is dysfunctional if we don't have healthy aspirations for happiness if our aspiration for happiness is i need more stuff i need more of that stuff out there then all that some mindfulness is going to do is maybe make us better at trying to get that stuff, maybe better at how we can deceive and cheat people to get more thing, money from them. And then we're just going to have more problems in our life, more agitation, more disturbances. So I think this motivational balance is key in particularly our modern world is that there's so much focus on out there and if we can really shift that to you know the the difference between pleasure and genuine happiness if we can really shift that motivation instead of trying to get see the thing is that with this motivation that that stuff out there is going to make me happy it's never going to fulfill you it, it's it's like drinking salty water it'll just make you more thirsty and not only that, with that approach, we're destroying our planet. Resources, I mean, look at the environmental degradation. And also, there's never enough stuff out there. because So what happens is you get competition, you get conflict. So it's just a big mess. And we see this now in the world. Okay, good question. Um, there's, a, of course, a number of things we can talk about here. Um, but I think sort of at the, the initial level, uh, low self-esteem, again, is about wrongly identifying ourselves with our thoughts, emotions, habits, memories, and so forth. Because we are none of those things. We're not our thoughts. Because either we are our thoughts or we have thoughts. We can't be them and have them. We have thoughts, so we're not our thoughts. Either we are our emotions or we have emotions. We have emotions. Either we are our memories or we have memories. We have memories. Either we are our habits or we have habits. We have habits. Either we are our personality or we have a personality. 
We have a personality. So these are all things which we have. So if we wrongly identify ourselves with any one of these things, it's a distorted view. Plus, we end up with a fixed biased view of ourselves. Because if we have, let's say we've done some bad things, then let, we have a habit of doing some bad things. I mean, everyone has a habit of doing bad things sometimes. But if we identify ourselves with that, what we're going to say is, I'm a bad person. So then we end up with a fixed biased view of ourselves. And then it becomes difficult to acknowledge any good things we do. Because bad people don't do good things, which means if we do something good, we'll go, well, I'm just a bad person. I, it was sort of accident, really. I didn't really mean it. I'm not a good person. I'm a bad person. And so that's where low self-esteem comes from. And that's actually where guilt comes from. For example, if we've done something harmful and we feel guilty, what are we focusing on? Bad me. So guilt comes from what's called cognitive fusion, wrongly identifying ourselves with our bad behavior. And guilt is completely useless because all it does is it paralyzes us and makes us feel bad. It's not even addressing our negative behavior. It's completely useless and it's based on an invalid perspective. There is no such thing as a bad person. There are only people who sometimes do bad things. And if we have that correct perspective, if we've done something harmful, we're not saying deny it or ignore it. We're saying instead of saying I'm a bad person, which is an invalid perspective because we're not our behavior. Instead of that, we say I have done a bad thing. Then we can have regret because if we've done something harmful and we regret, we're regretting the behavior. So regret comes from a valid perspective, acknowledging we've done a harmful thing and that can help motivate us to overcome that negative behavior. So regret is useful and it can lead to trying to overcome the negative behavior. Guilt and low is completely useless. It's based on the wrong perspective. So we never need to feel guilty about anything. And similarly, low self-esteem comes from wrongly identifying ourselves with our behavior. If we don't do that, and I'm not suggesting we deny or ignore any negative behavior. We just simply correctly acknowledge, I've done that harmful behavior. Then we can still feel good about ourselves, but not tolerate our negative behavior and look at overcoming our negative behavior. Unfortunately, in some modern, because this low self-esteem is epidemic in our modern society because of this, because two things, we have obsessive focus on the negative and wrong identification, cognitive fusion. But then unfortunately, some modern therapies uh, as a way of overcoming low self-esteem, they still do cognitive fusion. So instead of, they tell you, oh, don't say you're a bad person, you're a good person. In fact, you're a special person. Disaster, absolute disaster. Because what's happening is now you're replacing the, identifying the person with a bad thing with getting them to replace that with identifying themselves with a good thing. Again, invalid perspective. Because what's going to happen there, most likely, two things will happen. One is, if we identify the good things, I'm special, we'll get a big head. We'll think, I am special, in fact, I'm better than everyone else. So we'll get, a, we'll get sort of this arrogant attitude, thinking we're better than everyone else. And then, of course, when we can't really live up to that, when we see we're not really that special, we'll go even, that'll even confirm to us, I'm really a bad person. So the solution is not to replace bad person with good person. The, the solution is I'm a person who sometimes does bad things and sometimes does good things. Then we can feel good about ourselves. We can increase our positive behavior and we can decrease the negative behavior. So I think that's uh, going to help with the low self-esteem. And of course here uh, at a deeper level, the self itself. That So that's at the sort of the the level of um, the emotional balance, not to identify, but we can go at the deeper level of cognitive of where is the me that is feeling bad? Where is the me that has the low self-esteem? So that's going to a deeper level. 
and that's through the cognitive. So the, the, the wrong identification is this emotional, but we can go to that next level and look, well, where is the me here that has this low self-esteem? And look for that me. And what you'll, if you look, you won't be able to find. And that not finding is cutting through this um, distorted view of reality, this idea of an independent versus dependent. And all of these things like low self-esteem and anger, jealousy, are all based on that distorted view. So if we target that, we can cut at the root all of these mental afflictions like anger, jealousy, craving, low self-esteem and so forth. Well, then you might say, well, why don't we just do that and forget about this? It's not going to work because this emotional imbalance now is interfering with us trying to cut the through the, yeah, our fundamental ignorance. So we need short-term strategy, long-term strategy. Short-term, we work directly on working on reducing low self-esteem, anger, jealousy, and so forth through this, through cultivating loving kindness, empathetic joy, equanimity, compassion. And at the same time, we work at a deeper level trying to cut the underlying cause, this distorted view of reality. So we need to do both of them together. And that way we can really overcome not only low self-esteem, but all mental afflictions like anger, jealousy, craving, fear, <coughs> anxiety, all of it. So I think that might answer something from the question. Uh, meaning they're yeah. denying doing bad things or they've never done any bad things? Probably they're denying doing bad things. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, then there's no much either of cognitive or emotional balance because they're, they're distorting what they apprehend. They're, they're what's called, they're, they're in the deficit. They're denying what's actually there. Um, and so, of course, that's, that's going to create a lot of problems for them because, see, the thing is that that's often what we do is that a lot of these things, we don't know how to deal with them. So either we get caught up in them and suffer a lot or we try and cut or suppress. But both getting caught up and trying to suppress is detrimental to our physical and emotional and psychological health because suppressing these things um is really harmful in terms of often it builds up a bit of a pressure cooker and then eventually some little trigger comes and it's like like an exploding, exploding volcano but also suppressing it often causes a lot of physical problems in the body i mean a lot of a lot of modern day physical problems are suppressed are these suppressing of these things but again what i think some modern therapies acknowledge that suppressing like anger, jealousy and that is very harmful psychologically and physically. But then again, often what the therapy is, let it out, let it out, <laughs> you know. So, you know, some anger therapies is just shout and scream and, you know, punch, punch a pillow, do something. OK, in the short term, it releases the pressure. But all you've done is gone from suppression to expression. So all you've done really is now you've increased your tendency to express anger. So next time, you know, maybe you're punching a pillow today, but tomorrow you're punching someone's face. So that's not a good solution. So it's not a matter of expressing or suppressing. It's a matter of the middle way between those, diffusing that through these two uh, cognitive and emotional balance training. But again, I think that to begin that, we need to first recognize these things. And often we don't because our attention skills are not very good. Like, you know, we're basically now stimulus reaction. Some stimulus comes in our day and then what do we do? We just automatically react on habit. And a lot of our habits are not very helpful. And even though we may want to change those habits, we're sort of stuck because 
you know, we, some stimulus comes, we react, and then after we go, oh, I did that again. We, there's no way to change because it's too late once we've already reacted. I mean, of course, we can regret and so forth, but the best is not to react. <coughs> to start to shift that, we need this. Well, one is we need this to understand that this sort of reaction is not helpful. But then on, on that basis, we need to work with attentional balance because there is a window of opportunity from when the stimulus comes until the point our mind is out of control with anger, jealousy, and we're reacting. We need to catch it before our mind is out of control because once our mind is out of control with anger, jealousy, about the only thing we can do to avoid saying and things, doing things that we regret is get out of there fast. But the, the, the best is, of course, to catch it before our mind is out of control. So there's a little window of opportunity from stimulus to out of control mind. It may only be a second or two. Normally we won't catch it because we're not aware. We're only aware we're angry when already we're out of control. But with attentional balance training, you can get that window of opportunity. You can notice some tension, agitation coming up in the mind. You go, oh, hang on, what's going on here? And then one very simple thing to do is just watch it. Because if we watch it, two things will happen. One is if we watch anger, for example, anger coming up, we're free of it. We're not caught up in it because we're watching it. And secondly, now we're observing the anger itself. We're not focusing on the thing that's causing the anger. So there's nothing feeding it. So it can't go anywhere. So it will just go, gone. So to really begin to make these changes, we, we need this attention training. Because otherwise, it's really it's too difficult because it's only after the event we sort of regret. We want to catch it before we get caught up. So attention training is very important for that. Mm. Just coming back to what you were saying, if we're naming that emotion rather than the behaviour that's included in it, then it's kind of releasing and freeing that emotion. Is that what you mean? I, I didn't catch the beginning. Something um, about... Just coming back to what you were saying. Sure. If there's a set of behaviours, perhaps like anger, if we name that anger and watch it, yeah. rather than rely on the, the factors that brought the anger to us, mm. so, we release that, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so there's a number of things we can do here. So the one I've just been talking about is using this mm -hmm. to diffuse anger. And one of the things we can do to help us actually is to name it. Yeah. Because if you name it, you, you get some space from it. Yeah. So sometimes labelling what's coming up is helpful. Even joy or attachment to it. Yeah, exactly. If you label it, then it becomes an object. It's not, you're not stuck there. Yeah. But that's one thing. But we also, on top of that, to work with things like anger, it would be helpful to do these things as well. Mm -hmm. To not only just watch anger, but also work on cultivating loving kindness and compassion sure. and also work on yeah. seeing reality as it is. Because the reason anger came up is we're not seeing reality as it is. We have a distorted view of reality, and that's the basis of anger. So if we do all of those three things, we can have a three-perspective approach on everything like anger, just watching it, developing the opposite, loving kindness, compassion, and then cutting the root, our distorted view. So if we work on those three together as a package, the best. I was going to ask, uh, like, you know, that uh, uh, if a person has, for instance, I need to take some actions, but I have some fears, I was to take those the right actions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's kind of. Okay, uh, yeah. The, yeah. <sighs> the reality is that every situation is unique. You, there's no book you can go to that says, do this, it doesn't exist. So what we need to do is, on every situation, we evaluate. And the basis for evaluating first is, if we have this, we can see this situation more clearly. If we don't have this, we may not see it clearly. So then we make evaluations that are not really accurate because we're not seeing it clearly. So this is going to help us to see the situation clearly. And then what we can use to respond is these two things, our wisdom and compassion. 
if we use those as the framework for our response, that's the best we can do. And is there a guarantee we'll do the right thing? No, because we may not have got these fully developed. But if we use these as the framework for responding instead of anger, jealousy and so forth, we're going to have a much better chance of doing something beneficial. Of course, sometimes even using these afterwards, we realize, oh, OK, that wasn't the right thing. But then instead of beating ourselves up, we go, OK, next time I'll do this. We learn from that <coughs> because sometimes not doing anything is the worst option because I'm not sure, so I won't do anything. But actually, sometimes that could be the worst option because someone maybe desperately needs your help and not doing it may be the, actually the worst thing to do. So we can't just sit there and go, until I'm 100% certain I'm not going to do anything. I think that's also not a good approach. So about not taking actions or regret? Yeah. So again, part of cognitive is to evaluate, can I do something useful? And it, sometimes it may be, um, this situation is too difficult. Too difficult. Uh, I think the best thing for me is to get out of here. That may be, but that's based on wisdom rather than fear and just running out of there. Then we use our wisdom to decide, okay, I think the best thing for me to do here, because for example, maybe the person's in a rage. I mean, generally, if someone's in a rage, no matter what you say, it's like throwing petrol on the fire. So wisdom says, okay, well, there's no point in me trying to say anything here. I need to just back out of here, let them calm down. I'll come back later and then maybe try and say something. But that's, that's different than simply running away, being afraid. That's actually using this to evaluate and try to come to some decision about what to do. The last does, question. Yeah. Where does discipline come in? To the discipline. Discipline, yeah. Because uh, I was listening very carefully and you never mentioned that word. So I was kind of curious. Yeah, that. discipline. Yeah. Um, I mean, of course, I mean, it really comes in all of those yeah. discipline. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's sort of, I mean, of course, there are many uh, elements in all of those. And, and certainly, um, I mean, this really, I mean, it can really come in a cognitive understanding that um, if we want to achieve something, we need to put some effort and be disciplined in what we do. So, yes, I mean, it, it applies in all of those, in all those areas of, of, of to be disciplined. Um, because we need to, I mean, actually, and we know this from our own experience, is that often the times where we most develop as a person is not when our life's going well. When our life's going well, we just sort of float along, you know, don't we? It's only when some difficulty comes our way that challenges us, then we often, that's when we most develop as a person. And so then the same with all of this is that, of course, in all of this training, there'll be difficulties. But if, if some difficulty comes and go, oh, it's too difficult, I give up, we're not going to get anywhere. So, yes, yeah, so if we have that perseverance, that's where we're really going to develop the most. So, yeah, perseverance is, I mean, there are many elements, and certainly perseverance is a key element. Okay, um, yes, we've run out of time there. So um, I'd just like to say a couple of words to finish. So um, I think they've already mentioned that uh, tomorrow night I'm giving another presentation, What is the Mind? So, again, it's the... Uh, introduction to this first module of discovering Buddhism. So I want to really look at the mind in terms of not only the Buddhist theory of mind, but I want to look at the sort of the prevailing scientific materialistic view of mind, that the mind is the brain. And I want to compare those two. And also within the Buddhist view, I want to look at, well, how is the mind defined in Buddhism? Where did the mind come from? Um, how does the mind work? Uh, what is the nature of our mind and what is the potential of our mind? What can we do with our mind? So these are some of the things I want to cover tomorrow evening. And then uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, uh, there's this stillness in motion retreat from 10 till 5. And it's mainly we're going to be doing attention balance. That's the, the core. Um, in particular, we're going to be working with the mind, observing the mind and resting in awareness. 
but also we're going to be touching on these elements, particularly um, we're going to have a number of sessions on emotional balance training and including that also, I mean, also these two are going to be there because again, it's important to have that integrated approach. So even though this is going to be the core, we're going to spend quite some time there and then also we're going to touch on the other two elements to really give it a complete package. So that's for the weekend. Um, and if you want a copy of the article from this evening's talk, I think at the back there's some copies. You, you can grab a copy and take it home and have a read of it if you want. So that's it. So thanks for coming. Okay. Thank you very much.